Hey, everybody. How you doing? Steve uh, Martirano here. Uh, a moment before we get into the nitty gritty here. Now I got to remind you again, you, you will have our uh, eternal gratitude if you just click that subscription button. We need, we need your support in that fashion. Hit the button, subscribe. We'll love you long time here on the Behavioral Corner. Hi and welcome, I'm Steve Martirano and this is The Behavioral Corner. You're invited to hang with us as we discuss the ways we live today, the choices we make, the things we do, and how they affect our health and well-being. So you're on the corner, The Behavioral Corner. Please, hang around a while. Hey everybody, how are you? How you doing? Welcome again to The Behavioral Corner. It's me, hanging out, Steve Martirano, The Behavioral Corner, where we, uh, we discuss uh, everything, because everything affects um, our purview, which is behavioral health. It's all it's all made possible by our great great uh, partners, Retreat Behavioral Health. You'll hear about them a little bit more down the road. So we have we have something we've done a couple of years now in a row, where uh, July is designated as um, Minority Mental Health Month, and that's that's a terrific idea. I mean, even in spite of the fact that there's a month for everything, you know, you know, there's a month for lawnmowers, there's National Lawnmower Month, this is crazy. But every now and then there's one that really matters. <laughs> and so uh, we've been focusing on them yearly um, here on the corner. And uh, we, so we thought, you know, we, we wanted to do it again this July. And, you know, how do you do that best? You, you go into the community and you find somebody that's, uh, you think, uh, certainly uh, sharp and, and interested in the same thing. And, and that's who we have for you today. Uh, Paul Brown's a, a young fellow I met uh, here in my neighborhood of, of uh, Philadelphia. And, uh, and, and Paul is, um, can best be described as a searcher of truth and, and knowledge. That's what he, that's what he his, his advocation is that. Uh, what he does for a living puts him in a, 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 a unique position to, to search out some of these issues. Uh, he, he cuts hair. He owns a barbershop. He's a barber. And if, if you know anything about a lot of minority communities, uh, barbershop is a real uh, focal point. It's, it's kind of like ground zero where folks get together and talk about all kinds of stuff. So we got lucky and met Paul and, uh, you know, dragged him here on the behavioral corner. Uh, Paul Brown, thanks for joining us. How are you? I am doing great, Steve, and it is a pleasure to be here with the Godfather of Radio. <laughs> As you can tell, I've done my work with Paul. He, he thinks I invented this. I'm eternally grateful, and I'm going to do nothing to dissuade him of that. Anyway, uh, so, so Paul, you know, Paul's podcast, and incidentally, I buried the lead here, as we say in the newspaper business, uh, in addition to his uh, job as the owner of a barbershop, he is uh, a a brand new, relatively brand new podcaster. And Lord knows we can't have uh, too many new podcasters, Paul. So welcome, welcome to the family. His podcast is called, and I love this title, It's Always Personal in Philadelphia, which obviously is a play on words, uh, play on titles. And I'm going to have Paul tell you about that. But, I, I, you know, I know I noticed that there, there is an intersection between what Paul wants to do on this podcast and what we talk about in general which are the things that affect us emotionally, psychologically, and, and even physically, uh, behavioral health issues. So Paul, tell us first about um, how you, uh, how the podcast came into being. Mm. Well, uh, the podcast came around by me actually, like just educating myself. I was reading a lot. Mm -hmm. And while having these awesome conversations in the barbershop, which I'm used to having, I noticed that a lot of people uh, had a lot of opinions on the black community without any really historic facts behind it. And just in the conversation, instead of me trying to debate with someone, I, I, I was thinking about a way where I could pretty much educate them without being interrupted. And I thought, wow, a podcast might be a good way where I can try to carry a conversation without people realizing and, and teach them without them realizing they're being educated. Uh -huh. and, and that 
<laughs> and it, it just led to more deeper conversations with the, yes. the people I'm always around. Yeah, it's a great insight because most people think that a conversation is um, only confined to a couple of people who have uh, well-held opinions. Mm -hmm. Almost doesn't make any difference what the opinion is or whether it's based on anything. That sort of makes up the majority of most conversations. But it's uh, interesting to go, well, I mean, they're entitled to their opinion. Let's see if we can give them some some facts. Right. Maybe their opinion, maybe their opinions get stronger or maybe they change. So it's a great idea. And as I said, you can you do it in that context of the barbershop, which which I just think is a is a killer way of uh, <laughs> tying a podcast together so yeah so you also told me uh earlier before we got on the the interview <laughs> that um you're careful about who's here you who, who's sitting in your chair right yes yes I, I i learned to cut hair in toronto i was born and raised in philadelphia but i lived in toronto for about four years and then coming back to philadelphia it was just a culture shock all over again Mm -hmm. And I noticed that the mindset, you know, Philadelphia is an awesome place. Even though the media lens only shows Philadelphia in a negative light, you, you want to have to realize that Philadelphia is an amazing place. But at the same time, you have to do everything you possibly can to protect your energy. So I typically only give my business card out to people who I can actually have a conversation with. I mean, a true conversation. And, and that has been incredible for me especially how it manifested itself into the podcast because it shows that i literally only keep myself around people who can help nourish my soul and elevate me in every way possible yeah it's a great trade-off they get they get they get they get styled and and you can get schooled and so can they it's a great i love it but you know that when we first met three almost three years ago now before the pandemic and you told me that you know you have a barber shop and you want to do a podcast i went that's exactly where to do a podcast from a barbershop. Before we get into some of the mental health issues that I know you want to touch upon uh, with regard to the podcast, how many episodes do you have under your belt now? I think 77. Nice. Uh, in, in, in what, a year or two years? I've been doing it now. I, I look back. It's actually three years. I, I, when I first started, I, I think I did a commercial for, for uh, the platform I'm on, which is Spotify. Mm -hmm. that I've been operating for a year and a half. I would say I've, I've learned, I've taught myself how to direct, edit, sound engineer, um, and produce my episodes. That's been about a year and a half. Yeah. Well, I've heard them and they are, you know, you, 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 it's a steep lean, uh, learning curve for, for anyone. Uh, and, you, and you certainly picked it up. It, it's, it's, there's nothing homemade about this thing. The way it sounds like, you know, NPR is producing uh, your podcast. It's a very, very well done job. Everybody should should uh, listen to. By the way, we will have a link to your site as well on ours, so we can do a little cross promotion for you. It's a, it's a well done show, and and Paul's dedicated to this idea that it's not just a bunch of people spouting off. It's a it's a bunch of people trying to, um, I guess, raise the bar on any whatever topic they're talking about, which is a uh, the best goal possible. Um, what you, so so uh, you you were telling me? <laughs> you, do you record it? You record some of it right in the shop while you're working, or has that been difficult because of the clippers and the scissors and all that? Yeah. So I uh, try to record while cutting hair, and while those conversations are awesome, mm -hmm. my wife my wife is, is incredible. Like that's the one thing about us. Like. She never holds back the truth, right? Right. And she was just like, I like, I like it, but the, the clipper sound is just, it's, it's annoying. It's like, <laughs> right. Uh -huh. And, uh -huh. and as, as far as I've gotten, as far as like a sound engineering, I've never been able, I can, I can lower the sound of the clippers, but it's still there. And it's just, mm -hmm. it's just irritating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you know, I, th I want you to try to overcome that. I don't know that it can, because I'm, I believe me, I'm not the, the technical whiz. I have a great guy who works with me on all this stuff, but we've got we, together. We've got to get it. We've got to get it figured out so that you can do these things while you're cutting hair. I want to see that uh, in action because I know it will be fantastic. 
let's talk a little bit about the kind of, uh, you know, like I said, you, you, for those of you who are listening, you know, in other parts of the world, and I hope you are, um, Paul and I met because we're, you know, in the gen generally the same area of Philadelphia. Um, Paul's shop and his podcast are done in the Germantown section mm -hmm. of Philadelphia. That's Germantown down that end, right? It's not Mount Airy, Germantown? Mount, right? Mount Airy. Yeah, well, it, and it's worth pointing out uh, that uh, Mount Airy and Germantown are, are one of the most culturally diverse places on earth. When Paul talks about the story of Philadelphia is never really told, they almost never mention uh, the Mount Airy section, which is a uh, renowned mm -hmm. neighborhood. It's big, but, but it's renowned for decades as being co committed to uh, diversity, religious diversity, cultural, racial diversity. They take it seriously up here. And um, you, you see it. You see it all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. All kinds of people mixed together, uh, managing to get along just, just fine. So that's that's where Paul uh, uh, does his work. His wife as well. You guys, you guys are partners in a building. Your wife's a physician. She's an eye doctor. Or something. Is that right? Yes, yes. My wife is an eye doctor. Uh, she's also Canadian, and it's interesting. Ah. Yeah, we just so happen to be in the underground railroad section of Philadelphia. That's yes. what Mount Airy symbolizes and represents. And it ended in Canada. So who would have thought that I would have brought that freedom back to Philadelphia? How oh, that trail yeah. still run, that trail still open, right? Still open. Uh, Paul, I, I know that you are not, you know, strictly speaking, uh, doing this podcast devoted uh, entirely to mental health issues or even behavioral health issues. But I know you're interested in some of these things. So what I don't want to do uh, to to you know to bring awareness to uh, the unique struggles in the minority community when it comes to mental health issues is just throw a couple of things out there now, and you can um, react to them from a personal. Uh, point of view. Uh, one of the first things that I think minority communities run into when trying to get mental mental health help or treatment is uh, costs. That's a that's a big factor, right? Yes, yes, it's a huge factor. I, could, I mean, my personal experience. I remember when I was younger, like uh, I had to choose between gas bills and a copay, and I will always choose the gas bill over the copay. I will only go if it was something I really couldn't ignore any longer. And uh, yeah. It, that's it has, about, that, yeah, that's about healthcare across the board though in a lot of uh, minority communities and, and even, and even uh, you know, uh, socially deprived uh, communities, uh, you know, overall. Yeah, you gotta choose between keeping the lights on and maybe getting your tooth pulled. That's a tough choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's anyone who's gonna be suffering from poverty, right? Yep, uh, yep. What about the aspect, uh, and this, and this again is cross-cultural, but I, I wonder what, how significant it is in your community. You know, there's a still a lingering sense of shame if you're having mental health issues. Do you see that in in uh, in your in your community in your experience? People go, I can't let people know I'm having trouble. I, I would say more or less to suggest to someone that you see a therapist is to suggest that they are crazy. So you got to attach that with it. But from, my, from the people I've encountered, like I meditate, right? I've meditated mm -hmm. before. And the idea of, med of, of, of talking to somebody in my community about meditation or mental health is just terrifying in the sense that you would have to really hold yourself accountable mentally and also people around you who are in your circle accountable. So there's a lot, there's a lot, it's terrifying if you think about it. Uh, and also the idea that people in my community also suffer from like systematic poverty. So they are taught to always be strong to get over whatever traumas they face on a daily basis. So the idea of going somewhere where you can't physically see pain or you can't physically see how it's hindering your life, that's just, is just so abstract for a lot of people in my community. Yeah. Is it also not um, considered either consciously or unconsciously as a kind of luxury? I mean, life is tough uh, just because I'm depressed or traumatized. And, uh, I, you know, I still got to I still got to go work. I got to do my thing. It's, it seems that one of the hindrances in the community might be just from that, like man up. Right. Yeah. 
Yes, that that's that's the main thing to man up. And I think a lot of it, that's why the book post-traumatic slave syndrome was so important to me because we've been taught for such a long time to be from our inception to be human flesh robots. We think about what a slave could be, something that you don't. It does have, like you were taught, you were subhuman, you have no feelings. So you, you only imagine how that would manifest itself with no help in 2022. Yeah, that, I, I know that that is, a, that is a topic that has uh, come up. You do a podcast about this, and I will, I will be um, embarrassed to admit that the, uh, the uh, term post-traumatic slave syndrome was mm -hmm. brand new to me. So mm -hmm. tell me how you found that, first of all, what it is and then how you found out about it. Okay, so one of my favorite hip hop artists, Nasir Jones, Nas, he dropped an album, an untitled album when Obama was running and it was a skit where uh, they have an, an audio actor talking to a shrink and a shrink was saying, you wanna talk this out, maybe it's post-traumatic stress, maybe post-traumatic slave syndrome. And then during Trump's administration in what was it, 20, probably 2017, I was uh, I was uh, editing. I just was teaching myself how to how to use sound bites and edit an episode I recorded with my friend Dr. Momir Parhan, and I searched post traumatic slave syndrome on YouTube, and all of a sudden it linked me up with a lecture from Dr. Joy DeGroom. and I was like, Jesus Christ! And I used that sound bite, and it later on led me to her book, which I read, and it was just. That led me, like it, reading the book, I was like, wow, I have that. I, I've always known I've had that too. What's the name of the book? Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. Okay, that, it's, fan, it's fascinating to think about that. Uh, so give me the, yeah, give me the uh, broad strokes. Well, how does it manifest itself? What, how does it affect someone like you? Never feeling, you're never feeling safe. I've always had, um, sleep problems I always thomas jefferson said that black people smelt bad and required less sleep and that seemed like it didn't a generational curse forever so never really being able to sleep well and when you do wake up you feel like you're 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 like a little bit more alarmed than usual um and now like uh it can manifest itself like hyper like aggression like sometimes talking to people and not, not being conscious of my thoughts and just being angry for no reason or getting angry or not even analyzing my thoughts and not being present at all. Um, do, do you know um, whether, whether uh, how widespread the treatment for this is? Are, are, are there African-Americans that are looking for mental health treatment for something like post-traumatic slave syndrome? Well, the way... The way Bahia Cross explained it to me was that post-traumatic slave syndrome was a state of being and that people could come out of it. It's that's why it's a syndrome. And I didn't know that like from uh, the, I didn't know that in the past, but she was explaining how you, you can, it's something that it's not a disease that, that you can't come out of, you can come out of it. Um, so for me, reading like these are these are social sciences we're talking about the he across as well as Dr. Joy DeGruy, and reading her book for, for me was a definitely a, um, a point of healing, mm -hmm. but also seeking therapy after that. You know, um, but to your question earlier about um, going to practitioners, me going to a practitioner who wouldn't even understand what post traumatic slave syndrome is. Would, would, would it wouldn't be a good fit. And therapists are similar to barbers. There's good barbers and there's bad barbers based off of, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Based off of, your, of, mm -hmm. of how you want to look and based off your personality, right? So it, it can be difficult to find a therapist that can help. Yeah. Well, uh, one of the other things that you, you'll see if you, look, if you look around enough about barriers to mental health treatment in, in uh, minority communities is that um, minorities are no different than anybody else. They feel more comfortable with people like them. Mm -hmm. uh, you look like me, you maybe have the same kind of 
background I have, even if you're better educated, but at least you look like me. Mm -hmm. um, I have heard it said, I want to know how you feel, that too much of the healthcare system is, is uh, the foundation of it is white. Mm -hmm. These people are basically trained to see things in a white context. And it, that can be a barrier to getting help into a minority community. Is that what you mean by reluctance? You got to get to the right therapist before you're ever going to be able to discuss these issues? Part of it could be that. Uh, I can only, so I remember my wife, right? Uh, I remember we have these in-depth conversations and me reading these books. My wife is mentioning how she, she used to view, like she would coddle sometimes like a, a, a white child in her chair when putting eye drops in. With a black child, she would say like, tough it up, right? And then realizing that through our conversation, like, why did I do that? I, I just became aware that I was doing that, right? Mm -hmm. and, it, and it changed, it changed how she approached things. So, uh, do they have to be white? Not necessarily, but but I think a lot of times white people are on autopilot. So part of what white people have to suffer from, according to according to um, post traumatic slave syndrome, is the fact that when blacks were lynched during the Reconstruction period, whites would come from townships to view this with their children. So if white people have the conditions to be on autopilot, to not really to have more empathy for a deer or a dog than they would a black person, that'll manifest itself in how and in, in how a healthcare provider may see you. Or the fact that like we've been taught to hate ourselves, black people have been taught to hate ourselves. So that mm -hmm. so that's always going to be there as well. So more or less, I've always seek people who respect my humanity more than anything else, regardless of race. Because you can be a black person who still has that. How, how do you respond to the to the criticism? And you hear it a lot now. Oh, come on, man. Slavery, slavery has been over 200 years ago now. If you're still suffering from some kind of residual effects, even though you were never a slave or, you know, most of your ancestors weren't, get over it. How do you, how do you respond to that? That get over thing, get over it. Well, at that point, I would basically, I would tell them to read a few books that like Color of Law was a great book by Richard Rothstein. He breaks down white covenants that actually led to systematic poverty and control. And that's more recent. Or I would tell them to like uh, go into dive into a little bit more history books and the, and the reason why we haven't, in our history, we had civil war that we glossed right over reconstruction because Andrew Johnson got in office and he basically gave uh, the Confederates the land that was supposed to be given via special order 15 to the slaves to just keep them in poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would just break down all of the elements that are there beyond just the slavery and the stain that was never addressed. But the, but the, the things that were done to actually keep people in color poor and with poor comes certain traumas. Like, you know, if you've read yeah, yeah. Uh, you you made the point um, when uh, in our pre-interview talk that uh, trauma, which is a problem that knows no color or economic class, uh, trauma is trauma. There are differences in the African American or minority communities when it comes to trauma. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about that. I mean, people associate trauma with a specific event, mm -hmm. a violent event, or physical abuse, or something. There's, there's a larger context in the minority communities when it comes to trauma. Am I right? Yeah, there's, there's a great book um, that is called The Framework for Understanding Poverty by Ruby K. Payne. And she was breaking down just what poverty does to you. But there's two forms of poverty. There's, there's financial poverty. And it's also mental poverty, right? So if the vast majority of, my, of, of people in the black community, brown community, have been taught for generations to hate themselves, right? That, that, that to get over it. And there is, 
that there, there's you have to seek your own, I guess, uh, own history, even in school. That will lead to a lot of mental poverty, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then if you think about the financial poverty as well, she was breaking down how that is true poverty. And that when you suffer from true poverty, it makes it difficult to even see past tomorrow. It's a handicap. So mm -hmm. it's just interesting seeing, yeah, like stuff. Reading that book helped me understand what was taking place in my community when you see violent yeah. crime. It's easy to see that if you seek this stuff out, as you are dedicated to doing with your podcast now, if you seek this information out, you, you, I think what you'll get is a better understanding of what's going on. And you won't fall into that camp of, oh, they're always complaining or they got to get over it because you're not schooled in understanding how traumatic and long lasting these things are. And we're right smack dab in the middle of that argument. <laughs> I mean, there are... I. You know, you, 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 you'll have an easy time finding people who have an opinion about a critical race theory, mm -hmm. and none of them know it. None of them know what, what it's about. Not, not a one of them know what it's about. I don't, you know, I barely understand, but I, I mean, I, it's a search for context, really. Just look, mm -hmm. at, the, look at the context of this thing. So um, it's certainly easy, easier to understand when you search after this stuff. Um, which I, again, I go back to you. It's uh, always personal in Philadelphia. Your podcast uh, does a great job at taking some of these things uh, apart like that. It's it's great. Tell us a little bit. I know you've done a couple of things about raising your children in a mindful way. Tell me what that means to you. What that means to me is I was you know in a previous conversation I told you I was forty years old. You were saying you look much younger than that. Right. All right. Uh, I've always my dad left me when I was a kid. So I guess most of the children in my generation were 80s babies. They all have pretty much are excellent parents for some reason. Mm -hmm. Almost it's rare to have a two parent household. But how that manifests in my life is. Uh, I remember I was during the quarantine. I always hid the fact that I smoked cigarettes. I was smoking like a pack a day at this point in time. And. I went on the porch, smoked a cigarette, came into the house. And my daughters, they were like, Dad, you smoke cigarettes? And I was, I, I couldn't hide the smell. And I was like, I, I don't lie to my kids, right? Right. And I, I was like, I really wanted to. <laughs> I was like, yes. <laughs> right, right. And they were like, Dad, you're, you're killing your lungs. We need you. It was almost like listening to uh, the Sean Jackson describe talking to Michael Vick. You need to stop running the way you're running. We need you the last of the whole season, right? It was just like that. And at that point in time, just being mindful and understanding that my children, I have to do this all for them. They literally saved my life in the sense I, I've been running like miles a day and working out the best of my possible, I possibly can. I don't smoke cigarettes, you know? It's, it's just recognizing them at, at, every, at every point in life and documenting this experience with them as being mindful. And just how, how, old, how, how old are the kids? How old are the kids, Paul? Ten and nine. You got them yeah. sweeping up in the you got, got them sweeping up in the shop yet? <laughs> yeah, they did that from the beginning, from the very beginning. The, the kids are are they just they just it's amazing. It's amazing to be able to be mindful enough to learn from your child and to have conversations with them, to like to listen to them, you know, uh, to recognize they're their own they're their own person. Right. Like it, mm -hmm. it, we I think a lot of times parents get caught up in trying to program the child to be just like you and not recognizing that you are raising a whole different human being. You know? Yep. So oh yeah. Yeah, those things keep me, you know, mindful with the kids at all times. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a great definition of mindfulness. Just keep your mind open. Uh I wanna I wanna sort of uh sum it up here with uh, one other obstacle or difficulty or uniqueness about mental health in the, in the minority community. Um, and that is the, the issue of trust. Mm. Um, from your perspective, this historic distrust of the medical establishment in the African-American community, is it still there? Is it, is it still a factor? Definitely it's still there. I mean, <clears throat> you saw it uh, play out a lot of people saw it play out when 
mnra vaccines came out right there were a lot of people who didn't they didn't even know like i had to do an episode about that it's called mnra vaccines for dummies on my podcast and it was you know the book series for dummies yes yep so um I did that for a number of reasons to show for one people weren't they were being insulted they were like they were insulted to begin with like wow you're not a reader it's a whole book series about that for dummies it explains to you what this is and having people understand what polio like the vaccine for polio how it helped save so many lives but there is a huge um distrust in in the medical community by the black community i mean there's a huge distrust uh in the black community for the medical community but it makes sense I mean, for like you mentioned before, this is the experience, and yeah, gynecology I mean, was, was came, came about by by practitioners literally practicing on live slave women. So it, it makes yeah. sense why it would be distressful. And, and most blacks know about Tuskegee and the horrible experiments that went on uh, back then. Uh, the other amazing historical fact that contributes to distrust is the uh, Henrietta Lacks. Uh, stem cell research that that family had no idea mm. the unbelievable things that were being accomplished because they um, because of their deceased relative Henrietta and the uh, the use of her stem cells. So anyway, th there's a absolute historic basis for this, and so uh, you know uh, African Americans have uh, they're cautious. They're you know they know the history here, right? And then here comes a pandemic. Here comes a miracle, and that's what it is. That's what these vaccines are. They were a miracle that had to be dis demystified for everybody. Certainly, right. white folks had to go, and they still, some of them still don't get it. This is not something they cooked up overnight. They've been working on this technology for years. They just, you know, put the pedal to the metal. And, and so, in terms of vaccination, uh, in the community, in the in the African American community, it lagged a bit, but everything I read now says that it's on par with every other ethnic group. Mm -hmm. um, black folks are get, uh, got vaccinated, mm -hmm. um, and so that's some progress, right? Or is that just a function of they had to go to work? You know, we got to go to work. Let's get vaccinated. I guess that was that was some some progress, but it was that was the biggest American issue right now with social media. Everybody's so tribal. In a sense that there's a there's literally like an argument. There's either people who are for uh, holistic medicine or for modern medicine. There's never both of them are useful. Mm -hmm. Both of them mm -hmm. should should be used. Like you you know and and I think that's why the, the need to educate as many people as you possibly can is so important because the average person unfortunately isn't reading anything. Yeah, that, this is true. Paul Brown, he is a, as I said, podcaster. He's with us to talk a little bit about what goes on in his community so that we can see, uh, get a little peek in there. The podcast is called It's Always Personal in Philadelphia. In addition to our podcast, you should listen to his podcast. Um, it really, you can open, it can open your mind and eyes to stuff maybe you hadn't uh, thought about very much. Paul, continued success with the podcast for sure and the barbershop uh any 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 help we can give you on how to record audio and video while you're cutting hair <laughs> let us <laughs> let us know we'd love to have you back from time to time to talk more about stuff that's going on in your world it's fascinating stuff i appreciate that steve it's, 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 it's an honor to be on this show it truly is i, I think you're remarkable and well, also th thank you yes I actually uh, was listening to uh, Living for the City all day, Stevie Wonder. Ah, Stevie. So people who listen to that song, Living in the City, my podcast is ultimately helping you understand what are the ingredients that contribute to that family who's just living enough for the city. Why are, they, why are these people always in this poverty stricken area is not because they want it it's because their systems there so my podcast basically breaks that down for you I'm, yeah I'm it's, a, it's a great point of entry 
uh, to, to learn about that stuff. It's always personal in Philadelphia. The creator and host of that, Paul Brown, our guest. I'm going to have you back as often as you'll come, man. I, this has been great. I'll see you at the cigar shop, right? Yes, sir. Steve, you're remarkable. Take care. Man. You're amazing. All right, Steve. <laughs> oh, thank, thank you. Hey, everybody, thank you all uh, for listening to the uh, podcast. Don't forget, we, you know, we're available wherever finer podcasts are had. If you like us, give us that little like deal. Uh, follow us on Instagram and uh, and Facebook and all that other stuff. Uh, till uh, next time on The Corner, take care. Bye-bye. Retreat Behavioral Health has proudly been serving the community for over 10 years. Here at Retreat, we believe in the power of connection and quality care. We offer comprehensive, holistic, and compassionate treatment from industry-leading experts. Call 855 802 Six six zero zero, or visit us at www.retreatbehavioralhealth.com to begin your journey today. That's it for now. And make us a habit, hanging out at the Behavioral Corner. And when we're not hanging, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter on the behavioral corner.